So tonight we're going to dive into the chapter of the book, Open Heart, Open Mind, that talks about mindfulness of thoughts. Mindfulness of the mind is another way of putting it. The chapter is um, the chapter 10 of the book, page 167 in the English text. And this is such a rich topic. Uh, you may have noticed already that if you are reading the book, or at least following these classes, that Sokni Rinpoche is giving his teachings through the lens of the four foundations of mindfulness. The four foundations of mindfulness. So the first is uh, mindfulness of the body. And often the common technique to cultivate mindfulness of the body is through one of the most important bodily functions that we do, which is to breathe. So all those practices that we've learned, mindfulness of the breath, fall within that first category of mindfulness of the body. But you can do mindfulness of the body through your different positions, lying, mindfulness of sitting, mindfulness of walking. Those are all mindfulness of the body practices. Also mindfulness of sensations in the body, but that gets more into the second category, which is mindfulness of feelings. And in the second category of mindfulness of feelings, of course we're feeling all of our feelings in our body, usually, <laughs> not always. Those feelings can be, um, can be physiological feelings, sensations of heat, cold, tension, release, and so on. They can also be psychological feelings, emotions. So in the last class we talked about emotions to a certain extent as well, and how they relate to the subtle body. Your issues are in your tissues, so to speak. So the subtle body is that bridge between the material and then the purely intellectual, you could say. So the, the physical and then the most refined or subtle aspect of our being, which is thought. And so that was the domain of last week's call, or two weeks ago, no, last week. And then today we're in the third domain of mindfulness, or the third do foundation of mindfulness, which is mindfulness of thoughts. Mindfulness of the domain of the mind. And so in a moment I'll guide you through an experience of that. There are many different techniques that have been taught from the time of the Buddha, and if you want to go deep down that rabbit hole, you can find uh, wonderful commentaries by many different teachers. One of my favorites is uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, actually does a commentary to the four, the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, which is this sutra or sutta on the four foundations of mindfulness. Uh, called Transformation and Healing is the title of his book, Transformation and Healing, Sutra on the Four Establishments of Mindfulness. Beautiful, very essential, traditional commentary, but very accessible. And he lays out all the different ways that the Buddha taught through that sutra of traversing the four foundations of mindfulness. And so tonight we will engage in that practice of mindfulness of the mind through observing thoughts and so on. Just as a spoiler alert, the fourth foundation is mindfulness of phenomena, which is interesting. It's all those things that come in through the senses, the outer phenomena, and how they come in through the senses. And in the next chapter, uh, Tsokni Rinpoche talks about that in a beautiful way in relationship to space how he sees that that fourth domain of phenomena as being awareness of space. So even I will co-teach the next class and we'll dive into that chapter 11 next week. So now let's shift and drop in and find a comfortable position. I'll guide a practice for about a half an hour. So if you want to be seated upright, find a comfortable upright position in a chair or on a meditation cushion. If you'd like to meditate lying down, you can find a supine position like Shavasana, the pillow under your head. Make sure you don't fall asleep. 
one little trick for not falling asleep is when you're lying flat is to take one forearm and have it perpendicular to the floor like imagine I'm lying down on the floor and if I just have one arm that's perpendicular it's kind of easy just to m mindlessly hold it up there and if I fall asleep it flops down and wakes, wakes me up <laughs> all right so let's go ahead and allow the eyes to close And begin to take some deep, luxurious breaths, breathing down into the belly. And releasing tension with the out breath. Like a, a leaf alighting, falling from the tree and alighting slowly, drifting down to the earth. All the tension, holding, tightness is just melting down to the earth, letting it fall away. Feel your hips stable on the cushion or seat, your feet if you're on a chair, nice and square on the earth, feeling the support of Mother Earth. If you wish, you can lift your shoulders up towards your ears, get real tight there, and then soften and relax them down. You can do that a couple times. Inhale as you draw the shoulders up, exhale as you soften them down. Really feel the shoulders and the arms relax like an old coat on a hanger. Notice any tension of the face softening. The jaw goes slack. The tip of the tongue resting at the upper palate at the root of the front top teeth. The chin slightly drawn in towards the center of the throat, lengthening the back of the neck, space at the base of the skull. The chest is buoyant and the shoulder blades are down the back. The belly is soft and receptive to the breath. Feel even the side body and the kidneys being breathed by this deep abdominal breath. If your waist is tight with the pants, loosen them. common instruction in the Tibetan style is to imagine yourself like a bundle of straw that's whose string has been cut loose and it just falls to the earth just and rest in that natural ease the hips the legs the feet relaxed the hands can be on the thighs or in your lap. If you're resting with the hands in your lap, you can place the right hand inside or on top of the left hand in the mudra of meditative equipoise with the thumbs touching. This position, however simple, helps to Ignite a Pavlovian response for the body, the mind, perks up. We're doing something special here. We're not just lounging. So bring a quality of wakefulness, even amidst the relaxation. Alert, yet relaxed. And as I've taught in the last couple classes, we'll spend a few rounds, three to five rounds of the vase breath as a way to stabilize the awareness, to 
induce a quality of concentration of shamatha for a meditation practice. So let's all exhale together. I'll guide you through the vast breath, fully empty. And then when you're ready, begin to breathe in, feeling the belly like you're filling a vase full of water from the base to the top of the torso, filling the breath. When you're full, hold the breath in. Let the belly soften outward like a ball of energy. And then a little lift at the perineum, closing the lower doors, the lower orifices. And then when you need to, releasing the breath, breathing out nice and slow. So we're coaxing the mind to drop out of the head and into the second brain, the belly. When you're ready, inhale, filling the belly, the mid and the upper torso, the lungs. Hold when you're full of breath, hold it in. And then feel the belly soften out. Lift at the perineal floor slightly, a gentle lift. And then a slight pressing down from above, just a slight one like the solar plexus is pressing down. And feel a ball of chi growing in the vase, the navel center. And then slowly release and soften if the mind is still up in the shoulders and the neck and the head let it drop down into the belly. Slowly inhaling, feeling that space, that ball of energy, that vase breath. Breathing through the nose when you're fully full of breath, hold it. You can swallow even to help pack the energy down at the navel, swallow. Release the navel out, lift at the perineal floor, a little pressing down from above. Feel that ball of chi cultivating at the navel center. Relax the mind down there. And then release and soften. We'll do two more rounds like that, moving at your own pace. No stress, no strain. Inhale when you're ready, filling the torso with the breath. When you're full, you can do a little chin lock even and swallow. Allow the belly to soften outward. Lift at the perineum, a little lift dropping down from above. Hold the breath as long as you can with comfort. And then when you need to, it's a slow release of the out breath. In general, the count is about a three to five count for the out breath. As you inhale again, about a three to five count, slow in breath. When you're full, hold the breath in, relax the belly, lift and press, holding three to five counts. And then soften. Gently release as you exhale, let the belly relax. And now just smoothly glide into a natural breath. And feel the after effect of this vase breathing. You may feel more settled, more grounded. You may feel like your awareness is suffusing your entire body, not just the upper centers. Just let the breath be natural and at ease. And now we transition into the mindfulness of the mind practice. Allowing all 
the while the breath to be an anchor in the body. One image that can be helpful is that you are a deep sea diver and you have your hand on, the, on a buoy at the surface of the ocean. And that buoy is the breath rising and falling within you. And then when we shift our awareness to observing the mind, the domain, the space of the mind, it's like putting your head under the water and looking to this vast ocean of your own mind, but never losing that root, that anchor of the buoy of the breath. It can be helpful now to slightly open the eyes and softly gaze at a comfortable angle towards the floor. Feel as if you're gazing into the space between you and the floor or the table, whatever is in your visual field. Let the gaze be soft as if you could see a full 360 degrees around you. And now open to this awareness of being aware of your thoughts coming and going. In the beginning, as we meditate, in the early days, the flow of thoughts can be like a raging river of non-stop thought, thought to thought to thought. But as we slow down our awareness through the breath and through opening to this quality of space within the mind, that raging torrent of the river begins to slow, become more calm. So resting with the breath, but from time to time notice what thinking, what is the content? It happens naturally. It's like a run-on show, never-ending. And usually uh, we're on autopilot where we identify with all these thoughts that are coming and going in the mind. And what meditation helps us to do is to sit back and notice, oh, there's that thought again. And we can recognize that even though that thought is an aspect of ourselves, we are not that thought. It can be helpful to bring to mind a thought, a conscious thought like the color of the floor or I'm lonely or what's for dinner. Any thought will do. It doesn't have to be deep. And just notice it, it's arising, it's passing, and it's dissolution. So everyone, let's do that now. Bring forth a conscious thought, like you're saying it in your mind. And notice its source, location, and destination.
bring forth another thought and then observe from where does it arise? Where does it abide and where does it go? Observe and stay with the breath in the body. Sometimes our thoughts feel so stable and solid, but really they're like drawings on water. They appear and dissolve without any stability, any solidity. So why do they have so much sway over us? See if you can feel into the non-solidity of these arisings and passings within the domain of your mind. If with the eyes open is too difficult, that's fine, you can close your eyes. Feel free to blink from time to time if you need to. And feel as if you were gazing into the space of the mind itself. The thoughts arising and passing like clouds in the sky, appearing yet empty of solidity. When you observe thoughts arising and passing within the mind, you may also become aware of the space in between thoughts. Perhaps you may even feel it as space that pervades all awareness, whether it's thoughts or non-thought. Stabilize that experience of awareness and when you are stable in that broader, more oceanic awareness, thoughts will arise and pass without preference or rejection. Just observe and release and rest back into that broader experience of awareness. Awareness is a more deep or more true aspect of your own mind. Familiarize yourself with that. You notice you've been lost in thought, just label it thinking. 
Come back to the breath in the body. Come back to that open, oceanic, broad, spacious quality of awareness. With your hand on the buoy of the breath, Gaze into the ocean of your own mind. In this practice called settling the mind in its natural state, we don't prefer or push away anything. Instead, we rest and observe, and we recognize that we are not those thoughts that come and go. We are the awareness that is aware of all of that coming and going. So if fatigue is there, let fatigue be there. If daydreaming is there, just give the mind a vast open space to roam. Don't constrict or tighten around thought. Rest in the vantage point of awareness rather than the vantage point of thought meaning don't fuse your attention with thoughts and ride off with them. Stay in your body, open, spacious, relaxed. Wakeful. If you feel that the mind is so ungrounded that you can't access this settling the mind in its natural state, you can always drop back into the vase breath. Do a few rounds to ground the mind, stabilize attention, and then re-enter with that stability.
into the last phase of our practice and do a little compassion practice through Tonglen. Tonglen is sending and receiving. It's a breath awareness practice where we send out healing wishes to anyone we choose to imagine in our mind's eye or a group of people. And with the in-breath, then we breathe in any suffering or pain transform it at the luminous orb, the indestructible orb of light at our heart center, where it transforms, and then we send out that transformed energy of healing light. So it's ascending, is the tong of healing, and the taking, or receiving, it happens with the in-breath. And so now take a moment to imagine, feel into who you might want to bring into your prayer space now. Maybe a friend, a family member, might even be yourself. You can always work with yourself. If you're working with yourself, you just breathe into your body. You don't imagine yourself sitting in front of yourself. So if you imagine another person or a group of people, imagine them in the space in front of you, your mind's eye. You can recall how they looked the last time you saw them. And any suffering, any ailment you perceive or imagine that they might be going through, see that surrounding them in the form of a dark smoky vapor. And with the in-breath, you recognize, like myself, they wish to be free of suffering. So with the in-breath, I will inhale that suffering in the form of dark, smoky vapor directly into that orb of light at your heart. Imagine you're like a superhero. Nothing can harm you here. It transforms as it strikes that luminous orb of light at your heart and then breathing out healing rays of cool, clear, luminous light, bringing relief from suffering, bringing any remedy you imagine they may need. So inhaling the suffering in the form of a dark smoky vapor, transforming it at your heart, exhaling cool, clear, healing, remedy, light. Stay with the breath. Let the heart be tenderized by this compassionate wish to help relieve the suffering of the world or a loved one or an animal. Maybe you're struggling with somebody and you've been battling them and making them into an evil cartoon character in your mind. Bring them into your mind now and soften the heart of it and recognize that battle doesn't work. Maybe I can breathe in the struggle, transform it at my heart, and breathe out the remedy of release and opening and a sincere wish for resolution and healing. Be intuitive here, make it your own, breathing in and breathing out. With each breath, you see the tension easing, perhaps the illness, healing, whatever it is. Just see with each breath the space around them, their body, their spirit, their eyes clearing.
May you be well, may you be free of suffering. Whatever spontaneous prayer arises, breathe it out with the out-breath. And over the course of the next few breaths, really see them like a vision and quest, visioning them fully relieved of suffering, fully rooted and manifesting their f true flourishing. Now let's widen our scope for a simple metta prayer for the whole world, for our country, for the struggles we endure, we witness, we try to help in some way. Let's bring the whole world, whether it's the epidemic or the racial conflict, political conflict, whatever it might be, let's wish in the sending spirit of the outbreath, may all beings be free of suffering. May all beings be happy. May all beings be safe from harm. And may all beings experience the true joy and bliss that is their birthright. And we'll close our practice with the dedication of merit or positive energy for the benefit of all beings everywhere. If you wish, bringing your hands to your heart in prayer and making a heartfelt wish that we share this positive energy for the benefit of all beings who are co-creating a new, better world on all levels. Emaho, how wonderful. A Tibetan phrase that is often the end of a meditation or a poem, a song. Emaho, you can say it if you wish. Emaho, how wonderful. <laughs> Emaho. So we're coming back now to our screen time. <laughs> Seems like it's the only way a lot of us get to connect with people outside of our immediate family, isn't it funny? But here we are, what a gift. And what a challenge. <laughs> I see some familiar old faces. It's good to see old friends and new friends. I'd love to open up the chat function for um, any questions or comments, observations about practice, this practice. Sometimes a nice way to share is your rose and your thorn. You know, what, what's your gift? What, what little aha moment or grace did you experience or realization? And then what was the challenge? You could think about that. And if you want to share, you can. Or if you have any questions... It's nice to enter into this dialogue after the practice because often we can kind of 
do the practice and then forget what was happening there or not really understand what was happening there. Okay, I see one coming in. Can you say more about the origins of the practice you have led us in? Yes, yes. So the origin is in the sutra of called the Satipatthana Sutta or the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. This is the book I was talking about earlier, Thich Nhat Hanh's wonderful commentary on it. I highly recommend it. I love his writing. I just, I totally love Thich Nhat Hanh. I had the good fortune of studying with him uh, a couple summers we did the family retreat with him, with our kids. It was one of the greatest things I've ever done. Um, Transformation and Healing, it's called. Sutra on the Four Establishments of Mindfulness is his translation. This is the original text is by the Buddha himself, but the commentary is by Thich Nhat Hanh. So I would say the origin of this practice is the Buddha's teaching. And then you have many different styles that are in that text, but also ha that have evolved throughout the centuries. And the settling the mind in its natural state with the eyes slightly open and feeling like you're gazing into the domain of the mind, that is a very Dzogchen, uh, which is from the Tibetan tradition. Dzogchen means a great perfection. Some of you might be familiar with that already. Uh, that's a particular flavor of the mindfulness of the mind practice. And yes, yeah, somebody just um, wrote in that they love the image of the buoy and the ocean. Uh, I agree, that's helped me a lot. And then the question is, but when I went under the water, I sensed the vastness of the ocean and I also felt that there were monsters in the water. I know I had that image too. I'm dealing with a lot of sadness and fear. I just noticed the fear of the depths. Yes. I mean, for real, have you gone diving and you look under and you're like, oh, your breath is taken away. <laughs> oh, and then another image I saw on the news today, there was an article about a, I believe she's a Turkish woman, if I'm not mistaken, who is a, one of the top deep sea divers. Uh, and she started a whole... Um, series of photos and articles on what is underneath the water and she's pulling up gloves and masks and plastic bags and sh revealing what's beneath <laughs> the surface that we often don't see is quite heartbreaking and the uh, the imagery was very powerful and poetic I wish I could just plop the link into the chat function right now, but I don't have that. You could search it. Uh, I'm sure it would come up easy. But that is connected to your question in our practice because oftentimes when we look beneath the surface, it, it ain't so pretty. And we stare or we witness the big white sharks or the sea monsters and or the trash. And that is um, an important process of turning towards or turning in and looking in however you want to imagine or feel that and building that stability of mind and then the capacity to turn towards the fear or the loneliness or the sadness with compassion with space and to stay with it often we see the scary monster and we're, we're off jutting like a ping pong ball around the room again and so really the true, uh, the path really starts in meditation when you recognize that you can't ping pong anymore. You just can't. It's like life or death. I'm so sick of the reruns. You know, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> and so to remedy the reruns or the ping pong is to slow it down through the breath awareness, through shamatha, which is calm abiding, concentration practice. The vase breath helps to do that too, to stabilize and slow us down so that we build, we grow our capacity to be able to stay when 
the big monster comes or the little rainbow fish comes, right? We stay. And that's the first step in transmuting all that pain within us is to, to be able to turn towards it, look at it, and then we begin to integrate it and heal it. And that takes stability of awareness. I think a lot of us come to meditation because we're tired of the, the run-on, the reruns. I was listening to a talk recently by Jack Cornfield. He said often when we start looking at the mind and thoughts, we, we, we realize that there's not a lot of new stuff there. <laughs> it's a bunch of reruns. <laughs> What's so interesting about that? And then why are we so committed to just rerunning it? It's a form of kind of like, I don't want to say insanity, but I want to say insanity. And then he went on to say, they're often these thoughts that we rerun, rerun, rerun are often one-sided and not true. <laughs> we spend so much time in that. And then of course there are deep thoughts and true thoughts and authentic thoughts and we know the difference. So yeah, the, 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 the vase breath, the shamatha breathing helps us develop the capacity to look. Then you can also do other work like feeding your demons, which we'll do on July 15th. Take note. And that is a really great way to develop the capacity to have a nice safe framework to look at the big scary sea monsters. Maybe we could call it feeding your sea monsters instead of feeding your demons. Oh, somebody asks, how do you deal with constant memories? What an interesting way to put that. It's almost like we're always in constant memory. <laughs> uh, maybe you could write another, another, like a qualifier to that question, because if you, I want to know more what you mean by constant memories. Like you're always ruminating, you always lost in the memories of the past this meditation, you, you notice, notice, okay, there's my rerun, there's a rerun. Is it that interesting? Do you have any recommendations for when the vase breath is challenging? I've been doing it a lot recently and loving it, but tonight the breath got all jittery and yawny, felt like something in me didn't want to do it. Yeah, did you just eat dinner? <laughs> Yeah, I think somebody, yeah, that's you, Katie. Yeah, see? Yeah, I could have had a caveat at the beginning saying, if you just had dinner, take it lightly. Yeah, poof. If you, if you eat, it's not a comfortable thing to do. It's more, it's better after a couple hours after you've eaten. So nothing wrong with you. <laughs> it's totally normal. And I'm glad you've been doing it and enjoying it. It can, though, having said that, even if you didn't just eat, some people do have a hard time dropping into it. We have so, we carry so much stuff in our bellies. And sometimes it doesn't, we don't want to let it float out like a balloon. You know, we're just getting ready for summer. <laughs> I remember one of my teachers said, when he was teaching this, he said, for those of you who want to look good in a bikini, this might not be a practice you want to cultivate. <laughs> and I thought, how funny, like, you know, some people might decide not to do this healing practice because they want to look good in a bikini, you know, I mean, good on them, but it's kind of a little sad. I enjoyed being pregnant because you really get to embrace the, the beach ball. Like, no, I'm supposed to look like this, so don't feel bad about it. So in a way, the Voss breath does kind of cultivate a nice little, a nice little full belly. But it's not like you're going to walk around like that all the time. But that's the way it feels when, you, when you're doing it. And they even say a sign of a really good yogi is that he's got a nice little, little, you know, Voss down there. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Katie says, that's nuts. Mystery solved. Glad I asked. Yes. Okay, Walt says, we use the reruns to tell us who we are, which we aren't, which is why I find the concept of no self personally to be so helpful. 
I know, isn't it great? Like the idea, the no self is so liberating. And I'm wondering how your wife is feeling about that now. <laughs> I remember you. I wonder if she liked uh, liked the, uh, the the becoming no one will make you a better husband. I wonder how she reacted to that. Maybe you could share if you did say that to her. If you don't have to, if you don't want to. Um, yes, but the reruns, they do, they do help to create this continuity of who I am. And there's some beauty in that, like the ancestral lineage and the, all the wisdom that we've learned. But when it becomes detrimental because it's a kind of a mindless rerun or painful thought reruns, like in, this is time for me to read a quote, actually, because um, in the book, he tells a beautiful story about this very thing. On page 169, he talks about a student of his who came to him. And I'll read, a, I'll read this passage. He's talking about her talking, and he says, As she spoke, she was engaging in a type of meditation, reaching into her mind to see what it showed her. Without effort, she began spontaneously to apply method and wisdom to her loneliness, meaning she turned towards it and was able to be with method of mindfulness and awareness and wisdom, seeing the empty nature of these feelings and thoughts in her mind. So effortlessly she began to apply method and wisdom to this thought of loneliness. This is why she came to him. She's feeling so lonely. And he says, this is a crucial point. As she considered each aspect of her predicament, she was meditating, acknowledging on a direct level the thoughts and feelings that had shadowed her for much of her life. As she acknowledged them, some of the judgment she'd held about these thoughts and feelings began to lift, and she was able to break them down into smaller and smaller pieces. The preamble to that is that she had been told by her parents that she's ugly, no one's ever going to love her. It was really sad. It's so heartbreaking. So she grew up, she'd never had a long-term relationship and was afraid she would be alone for her whole life. So that was the reruns that she had been told and in, internalized and then was perpetuating herself, believing those to be true. So through this inquiry and this meditative kind of dyad he was having with her, she was able to see the feelings and the thoughts and that they began to lift and she was able to break them down into smaller and smaller pieces. Over the course of our conversation, she experienced, at least momentarily, a shift in perspective. She wasn't someone trapped within the mirror of her loneliness and longing. She was the mirror. I'll read that last sentence again. She wasn't someone trapped within the mirror of her loneliness and longing. She was the mirror. Toward the end of the conversation, she took a deep breath. I just had a thought, she said. Maybe my mother felt the same way. Maybe she felt ugly and unlovable. I don't remember ever seeing her happy or smiling. I don't remember seeing my parents laugh together or embrace or kiss. And those other girls I grew up with, the pretty ones, the ones who got married, and then it goes on and on. And he says, well, do you know that they were happy? But the point is that she had a moment of insight through that turning towards and inquiring, telling her story, actually analyzing the reruns, but in a meditative way, being witnessed, she was able to see more clearly herself and to be the mirror. And then to understand that it wasn't her, it was something she'd inherited from her unhappy mother. And that's very healing, that kind of insight. That is emptiness into, and that is a realization of emptiness into non-self. Do you see why? Can I get some heads nodding, yes, no? Yeah. Because that's not her. That's, she's not 
bad. She's not ugly. That was something she had been told. It was a thought. It's not solid. Sometimes I figure out I'm anxious when I just have to go to the bathroom. The body is the source of the anxiety. I know. And can we meditate while we're at the, in the bathroom? It's such an important thing to do. Like, can you just be and not rush it? <laughs> As a mother, I'd always be like, I, have to, I, can't, I don't have enough time to pee. <laughs> Sometimes the shower was the only place I could be alone, you know. So slow it down, slow it down. We talked last time about the subtle body and how rushing, the speediness is a kind of a, a for, an act of violence to the subtle body. So, yeah, sometimes when we slow down, we get to see how speedy we are. <laughs> but don't judge it. Just witness it. That's okay. I'm noticing. And feel the space. Feel the space. Bill says, I found it interesting where and how different places these thoughts originated in the body, like a different wire in a circuit. Yes. Right. I asked you to observe the source, location, and destination of thoughts. It's a very interesting and very um, intentional question. Yeah, we can get feelings of, oh, the thought is in the heart, or the, the, the feeling comes out of my belly, or like, yes, but is there really a true source there? Like, is there a cave where the thoughts live and they pop out? And the whole point of that exercise is to actually realize the non-self of thoughts, the emptiness of thoughts. That they arise and pass, but they don't have any rock-solid solidity. There's no real source, no real location, no real destination. They appear, and yet they're empty. And we are so liberated when we can feel that and really understand that. That these thoughts are, are they're, they're true, like uh, Tsogni Rinpoche says, because they're here. You know, I might really be angry, and it might be important to show and feel my anger. But are they real? Is anger a real solid molten lava thing in me? Or is it a conglomeration of all different myriad of hormones and emotions and chemicals and reactivity based on external circumstances converging into this experience that we label as anger? Yeah, Buddhist psychology, how do you ask, is this method used in psychoanalysis? It, it has. It has been. There's a whole field of Buddhist psychology that's very interesting. I have a dear colleague who founded the Naropa uh, Buddhist psychology department, and it's a very important emerging field because you can imagine your question comes from this feeling that there's something very healing in this and it can be implemented in a psychological or psychoanalysis framework and I have studied with the Buddhist psychologists and I've benefited a lot from that. Dreame says, why is it better to do this practice with eyes open? Good question. So it's debatable if the Buddha even taught to meditate with the eyes closed. Newsflash. Like the texts say, let the gaze rest past the nose. So I'm not saying that meditating with the eyes closed is bad or invalid, because I like doing that. I actually love meditating with the eyes closed sometimes, and it's very valuable. And it was very popular in Burma and Thailand. Uh, and other within other traditions. Zen uses the eyes open, Dzogchen, the Tibetans use the eyes open mostly. So that is an open question there. So then having stated that, then we can let go of any kind of right or wrong, why are you open, why are you closed, we don't really know. But both are valid in different ways. And those who say, or techniques that, that advise to meditate with the eyes open, do so because of a few reasons. One, in particular, for this particular practice of settling the mind in its natural state, observing the domain of the mind, there's a quality of spacious awareness that comes about when the eyes are gently open. And it's as if you can gaze into the space of the mind itself. 
Another reason in general too that it's said that meditating with the eyes open is a good way to do it is that it helps to dissolve the boundary between inner and outer. That I only exist in here or I only can be in a meditative state when my eyes are closed and I'm inside. If we get used to meditating with the eyes slightly open or upward gazing, it depends on the technique, then we are, in a sense, we are learning to meditate in the world with visual stimuli. We're just not clinging to it or focusing on it. And that suffuses our living experience of washing the dishes, feeding the cats, taking a walk with a more meditative quality as well. Also, sometimes meditating with the eyes closed can make us dull and more prone to falling asleep. So the eyes, if you tend to fall asleep in your meditation practice, try to practice more often with the eyes open. It will help you stay more alert. Is there a skillful way to practice while crying and grieving? Yes, yes. Yes, good. Breathe with it, just like a thought or other maybe less powerful feelings you're observing, you're present with it. I like to just feel like I'm holding it like I'd hold a crying child, a crying baby, a crying child. So that you really, you don't abandon it, and you're also not trying to fix it. That's hard, because the mind often tries to rush in and go, why am I crying? Why? Uh, wow, oh, it's because of this, or I want to fix it. Mindfulness is so good for those moments of big emotional cries or upheavals, because we learn to view it, to be with it, to allow space around it, so that it can have its full arc. Because it has something to tell us, and there's healing in that. So just like you would view a thought, view the cry. Don't let the mind come in and co-opt it. Stay in the body, stay with the breath. Often when the cry starts, we stop breathing and we start thinking to get away from it or to try to fix it. So stay in the body and stay with the breath. I find myself crying much more, especially when I stabilize with mindfulness of body and compassion. During Tonglen, I found myself wanting to drop the practice and fully embody the crying and grief, but wondering if there might be benefit or a way to keep my seat and cry at the same time. Well, if you're having a big cry and the teacher's like, now we're going to switch to, <laughs> you know, something else or there are times when switching can be good and you can just stay with the breath and breathe in your cry. You could do Tonglen with yourself, not even think about another person. Breathe in the sadness, let it be there, bring it home and then release it with the out breath. That's a great time to practice Tonglen. The sadness, the heartbreak, whatever it is that is triggering the cry, breathe it in with the in breath. Let it be healed by that orb of light at your heart. And then breathe out space and integration and release. Whatever remedy, soothing feeling might help that. Not trying to fix or change, just being with it. Cultivating that capacity to be with it. Having said that, even if Tonglen didn't feel like the right medicine for you, you could stay with the prior practice of mindfulness of the breath, mindfulness of thoughts. If that was working for you, you could have just said, you know what, today I'll just keep going with that. In addition to origin, location, and destination, you can look for the shape, color, form of the thoughts. Yes, yes, these are old teachings by Padmasambhava. He has a whole wonderful uh, inquiry, guided inquiry into this, where you're not just looking for the source, location, and destination of thoughts, but you're also trying to see, does it have a color? Does it have a shape, a location? Which is funny because we do that with the feeding your demons too, right? But this is a different practice and that it is for a different aim in a sense because we're, what we're doing is we're really turning and saying this thing like a thought or a feeling that I thought was so solid and real, is it? Is there, does it, is there really a location to it? Is there concrete shape or substance to it? And through that inquiry, you realize the empty nature of it. 
Okay, my wife, Walt, my wife is actually quite comfortable with the liberating outcome of no self and encourages my practice. She simply feels that philosophically it can cause paralysis or overanalysis. I agree. It's so boring when people get too analytical with this stuff. For some practitioners, yes, she must. Mu she's much more of an intuitive Earth Mother type of person, though she's an academic. Awesome. Sounds great. Thanks for sharing that. Good. Okay. I agree with her. So, um, now we have a, a little bit more time. And I wanted to just share a couple more things about this chapter. In this chapter of Mindfulness of the Mind, Sokni Rinpoche talks about, you know, there are different ways we can approach mindfulness of the mind. He's, he kind of goes through some different techniques, like we can try to stop them in their track and cut them at the source to achieve some kind of calmness. Uh, but he's saying that doesn't really help much because it creates a sense of tightness, of tension in the body and in the mind. So this approach is very much, you may remember that I said, allow the thoughts and the mind to have a big space to roam. An analogy is the Tibetan uh, nomadic herdsmen of going out and just letting their sheep or yaks graze in the open meadows and giving them a large breadth in which to graze and not hovering over them and controlling them. That's the approach we do with this meditation of mindfulness of the mind. Nice and spacious. Also another approach would be to label thoughts. We played with that a little bit. Notice the emotions around thoughts can be helpful sensations around thoughts. Um, that's a valid way. That can be a nice anchor of label and then come back, label, come back. And another approach is bear attention where you're just, that that's the latter phase that we did in the meditation where you're not necessarily labeling anymore, but you're broadening your awareness and you're resting in a more open, spacious, bare attention of the mind itself and not just always fused with whatever thought that's coming up, like a face plant with the thought all the time. So what he says is that really at this stage of meditation where you're cultivating the capacity to be aware of thought, to not fuse with thought, um, and to rest in more spacious awareness, to notice the space between thought, this stage of meditation is where you are becoming familiar with the activity of your ordinary awareness. You're, you're befriending, you're noticing, you're becoming familiar with your kind of mundane mind, the activity of the mind, these reruns. And this is important. And so I'd like to close with just reading uh, something from page 172. He says, as we gradually turn attention to our thoughts, rather than being irritated, disturbed, or carried away by them, we begin to be amazed by their coming and going. We begin to appreciate the entire process of thinking in and of itself, that we're endowed with a capacity that can generate so much mental activity. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> in essence, mindfulness of thought offers us an opportunity to see how our habitual tendencies to believe our thoughts as solid and true shape our understanding of ourselves and the world around us. Just as producing waves is a natural function of oceans, lakes, and rivers, as one of my teachers once told me, thinking is an expression of the mind's capacity to generate judgments, memories, daydreams, and ideas. Like taking time to become aware of and alert of, alert to our physical sensations or feelings, mindfulness of thought doesn't involve analysis. We simply notice, oh, there's a thought, whoops, there it goes, here's another thought, there it goes. Because thoughts can be quite elusive, however, it's best when we first start out 
to practice in an environment that is relatively free of distractions. Most people find it easier as well to assume a stable physical position, assuming either the seven-point posture or the three-point posture described earlier, and he goes on and on. But that is reassuring. Don't, don't develop an adversarial relationship with thoughts. It's actually pretty amazing what the mind can do, isn't it? So have a light touch, a compassionate, spacious heart around all of these creative displays of the mind. The ropa in Tibetan, the creative displays of the mind. It's very creative. And then channel it in a good way. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that's all I have for you, you know. I mean, do any other questions or comments? I'm at the end of my, my plan. We've got about eight, nine minutes. Any lingering creative displays? Are you speechless? Okay, maybe Katie, it'd be good to post the the link again for Donna, so it's easy for people to just uh, click on. Um, somebody asked me where did I study with Tignat Han? It was in Plum Village in in France. So there were two summers that I took uh, my husband and I took our daughter, and we visited some family friends, stayed with them for a bit, and then we went over to Plum Village. The beautiful retreat centers there, and I just saw. If you search on Instagram or Facebook, maybe, but I saw it on Instagram, that Plum Village, that Thich Nhat Hanh's center, is offering online retreats, and it looks wonderful. It really does look like a, a, a wonderful opportunity to study with teachers who you normally wouldn't be able to study with unless you went there. Of course, Thich Nhat Hanh had a, hor a very powerful stroke a couple years ago, and as far as I know, he's not teaching publicly anymore, but he has wonderful disciples, students who carry on his lineage. Do you have any recommendations how to address current stressful conditions with this method? Yes, this is a really wonderful method to replenish yourself, especially if you find yourself taxed by the news or your activism or your work or your family to really give yourself time to replenish like you did by coming today. A common refrain I like to say is, manifest and take a rest. And this is a really great way to take a rest. Breathing with, settling the mind, and observing why, what, what is stressing you out. Do you have to believe that? Do you have to perpetuate that? Challenge yourself, can you find peace within the chaos? As the Tibetans would say, if you think this is bad, wait till the bardo. <laughs> the bardo is the intermediary space between this life and the next. All sorts of strange appearances arise that are like a nightmare, you know. They can be like a beautiful dream, depending on your karmas, or like uh, goblins and ghouls and your worst nightmares. So if you can gain stability, clarity and a heart full of confidence and love, then even in the face of the most frightening terrors, um, we can stay rooted in our authentic self, our true nature, which is luminous. It's originally pure from the very beginning. It's your Buddha nature, originally juicy and good. Yeah, you're welcome, everybody. Okay, thanks everyone. Sending you lots of love. Let's dedicate the merit of all of our time together. May all beings be free of suffering. May they be well and happy. May all beings be safe, free from harm. May they all taste the divine nectar of their true nature. Let's say together, e ma ho <laughs> e ma ho May it be so. <laughs>
We have to find joy in our life. We can't be serious all the time. You've got to find ways to have fun and celebrate and laugh and play. That's a sign of a great master, is a playful childlike disposition. So don't get the serious disease. Okay, you guys, lots of love. Good to see your smiling faces. We'll see you. Eve and I, I believe, will be on next week. Ciao, ciao. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Chandra. If people want to mute, unmute themselves yeah. and say thank you, you can. Yeah, yeah, we've got a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much.